We're doing Metroid Prime Hunters today. Hunters was a first-person Metroid game released for the Nintendo DS in 2006. Even though it received generally positive critical reception, it was considered at the time as a bit of a step down from the previous titles. That was before we had some really bad Metroid games to talk about. It's not hard to see why it was viewed like this if you picked up the game. When you realise you just bought Quake 3 DS and the main story mode is this cobbled together jungle gym made of multiplayer maps and recycled plot from previous games, and also your wrists are about to fall off because holy shit these controls. Let's get into the meat of things. Nobody really talks about this game anymore, so might as well be me. In this game, Samus is tasked with exploring the Alembic system, where untold power is said to lie. There are four levels, and each one has two plot-critical ancient items to find, called octoliths. Because octo, that means like eight. Br bravo Unlike Metroid Prime on GameCube that had you lock onto enemies, Hunters goes full FPS with touchscreen controls that let you use the stylus to mimic a mouse pointer. It's pretty precise, but just imagine when playing a game you're also writing a ten-page dissertation with a tiny pencil because that's how it feels and it gets rather painful. Anyway, point is, your wrist is going to feel like it's falling off after hours of play, despite camera movement being relatively fluid. But the big problem for me, ultimately, is that it lacks that viscerality of the GameCube Primes when you lock the fuck on and go to town. The intangible oomph you get in those games! Of course, the ability to lock on isn't best suited to multiplayer competitiveness, which is a big feature this time around, where obviously the ability to aim freely while moving is half the fun and challenge of fighting opponents in a first-person environment, so we are design boys today. That all doesn't change the fact that when I was at the final boss in the single player, my wrist was burning up like nobody's business. You also have to double tap the touch screen to jump. Okay, yeah, there's probably no other way to get around having to do that with this control scheme. But, uh, boy is it hard to time something when you have to input the command twice in the case of a double tap. You have to premeditate that second tap that will actually trigger the jump. This also makes jumping to dodge a fairly unreliable strategy. First-person platforming being kinda hard to begin with, well, I think maybe a more Prime-esque control scheme could have been worthwhile in the single player at least. And don't tell me you can jump with the face buttons, you know that shit's not viable when I have a pen in my hand. Aiming with the face buttons is an option, which I did try when I was younger, but basically only use that if you intend on hitting nothing. Anyway, to beat the game you have to find all eight Aetoliths, but to get one you have to collect three talisman-looking things that activate a portal. So you go to a place, you find the three things, then you get teleported into a boss room where you fight a tower with beams, and then the next one you fight an eye with beams, and then the next one you fight a tower again, and then in the next one you fight another eye, and then you realize there's only two bosses that they've recycled four times each. Every time you go through this whole rigmarole of collecting these three MacGuffins, you know at the end you'll be facing a boss you've already fought again with only minor changes. It's pretty dull. These bosses aren't great to begin with, so fighting them four times a piece is a chore. You know you've cocked up your Metroid game when I'm about to enter the boss room, and instead of being being excited, I'm like... <sighs> then when you beat the boss and get the Octolith, a countdown starts and Samus has got to get out of the level before she keels over. So run back to your ship. It's not super duper explained why she'll die if you don't get out of there in time. It's like you just gotta go or you're gonna die. The, the security system is in effect or something. And this carry-on goes on for every Octolith, eight times. And I get it, it forces you to reinterpret the layout of the environment so you can map out in your head the quickest escape route possible and put it into practice, therefore devising a challenging gameplay experience. But the event is so formulaic and unsurprising because it happens every time you beat a boss that it just becomes boring routine, and that's really the problem with this game. The reason I'm describing all these steps in such a clinical way is that that's how the game feels feels like a job. You do the same thing over and over with such little deviation. Get the things, do the portal, beat the same boss, do the escape, do that eight times, beat the video game. Metroid Prime 2 had you collecting three keys in three different locations, but that was three times over the course of like a 12-hour game. Well, this is eight fetch quests jammed into only five hours of game. Oh yeah, and Prime 2 had like different bosses and loads of unique events and you were collecting new moves and abilities as opposed to just a few guns like in Hunters and generally things happened. Metroid Prime 2 also had this element of purifying a harsh, dark, dismantled world and gave you a clear sense of overcoming tremendous odds over the course of an almost suicidal and hopeless quest, so what I'm saying is don't compare this to Metroid Prime 2. The only surprises you get here are the other Hunters, the namesake of this game, which I'll get into in a minute, and they're alright as well as the Guardian robots, who do suck. 
Oh, I activated slash picked up a thing. Are the Guardians coming? Oh, I did another thing. Am I gonna get ambushed by the Guardians? Walked in a room. Uh-oh. Here come the Guardians. Maybe I'm exaggerating, there are a few simplistic mini-bosses, I suppose. But even this guy gets copy-pasted into another level with a different color. The level structure ain't great either. Most levels are just corridors with portals at the end that take you back to your ship, rather than big sprawling locations that loop back on themselves like in older games. Oh, oh, oh yeah, it also doesn't help that the campaign in Hunters is actually just the afterthought to a multiplayer mode, so most of the game is just a bunch of different fighting arenas stapled together. Yeah, apparently mid-development, when they showed off their little multiplayer player demo at E3, everyone liked it so much they decided to scrap the single player they had and just make a multiplayer game. But then at the last minute they were like, oh, I, I guess we should make a single player out of something. Never is this more apparent than in this one level where they literally just decided to build the place by having you teleport between a bunch of different multiplayer maps. Like, you literally get in a portal and then it takes you to another multiplayer map and then you get another portal, and then... <laughs> this isn't even a different multiplayer map, actually. It's just the same multiplayer map copied again into another room. Were they running out of time? It's likely not gonna be the story of this game either that keeps you hooked, even though it's probably got one of the coolest premises a Metroid game has ever had, in theory. I said premises, the stuff that actually happens after that, not so much. A spooky transmission from a far-off corner of the galaxy tells everyone that an ultimate power lies hidden in the mysterious Alambic Cluster. The Federation receive the communication and tell Samus to go scope that shit out, but six other bounty hunters also receive the message. So this time, not only does Samus have to figure out what's going down, but she also has to compete with other hunters to see who lands the prize. And that is such a good idea, and very little is accomplished with it here. Instead, the bulk of the narrative is you finding out about the lost Alimbic race, and how an evil monster came and tried to mess him up, and they got wiped out, so they locked the monster away, and it's the same shit as before. Oh, these hunter guys do have cool backstories and different motivations for being there. It's just none of that is in the actual game, you just have to read about it in the manual or whatever. Sometimes you'll see them fighting each other or they'll try and trap you somewhere, but it becomes pretty apparent that they really have no idea what they're doing. Because while you're collecting artifacts, killing Eyeball and Space Dick over and over, running back to your ship before the countdown goes off, all they're doing is bumbling around accomplishing nothing as you do all the work. Their presence has little to no effect on the game world either. You think with six other people running around these levels, this would be a great opportunity to leave some environmental storytelling in their wake? In other Metroid games, usually other entities that are also traversing the same world as Samus leave behind little remnants of their past battles, or calling cards that paint a picture of what they were doing. Unless there's some super sneaky scan I forgot to do, I can't really remember that happening in Hunters at all. And it's a real missed chance to capitalize on the whole Hunters premise. It's like I care way more about these cool badasses trailing me than another tired ancient evil backstory or the lore forces you to read about. The idea is that after you meet them for the first time, they'll appear randomly on different levels, and something cool that does happen is that if one of the hunters kills you, they can take one of your octoliths away, and then you have to use your ship's computer to find which level they're currently on and hunt them down. Which is sick, it's like the one time you do hunting in this series about being a bounty hunter. I don't have any footage of this though, because none of these jokers were able to kill me. Their artificial intelligence being like... Not the most fine-tuned. The backstories you basically have to go to the wiki to find out about now are pretty cool, though. Like this guy Weevil is a space pirate Samus crippled on Zeebies, so he rebuilt his legs to be a turret. Noxus is actually just a cool dude who doesn't want the ultimate power in the wrong hands. And considering Samus wants it for a sketchy military organization called the Federation, who can blame him? Trace is from this empire of creepy crab-looking things that send members of their race out to prove themselves to the colony by finding something of value for the collective, which kind of makes them sound more hardcore than even the space pirates, to be honest. I want more on these dudes. Then there's Silux, which the series has made a big deal out of ever since by constantly teasing the epic Silux comeback, which still hasn't happened yet. Silux is like anti-Samus, decked out in stolen Federation gear, he or she is out to destroy said organization and Samus by proxy. It was evident that in later titles they were setting up some kind of cool rival game where the two would duke it out and who knows if we'll ever see that. Of course, Silux and most of the hunters kind of cause some weird little plot holes in the story that don't really add up. Like why are all the weapons these random hunters use conveniently also just lying around the Alumbic cluster? I can buy maybe you finding a few of them, but when you come across Silux's zippity zap gun and explicitly states it's stolen fed technology. So how did it end up here? Is Silux bro, did you drop a freaking OS key for it down 
anyone here? I mean, anybody? Actually, come to think of it, a lot here doesn't really add up. You see, in the lore you scan, it becomes apparent that when the big old monster showed up that destroyed the sector, was taken on by the Olympics, that nothing they threw at him worked. No weapons could kill the mighty beast, so they imprisoned him in a separate dimension or something. Only when you get to that dimension, you find him alongside a weapon that can kill him in like a minute. The Omega Cannon, the description for which says was never used by the Olympics because they considered it an abomination. Now I'm just kind of wondering how competent you guys really were. They hide this super game-long enigma throughout each level about how to defeat the final boss for real and get the true ending, <laughs> but the answer to that puzzle can just be entered at random at the end and it's no big deal. I mean, come on guys. In the same rooms as these stupid laser towers, there's always a ghost in there or anybody who enters this place will meet a terrible doom or whatever. But then it's like... Really? I'm pretty sure we have better security measures on present day Earth. Collecting lore in this game is just a hassle, man. For some reason, your save file doesn't give you a percentage for items, just for scans. But it's like these ghost lore things are invisible until you turn scan mode on, so they're like needles in a haystack. There's no way I'm going back in to try and get the ones I missed. And that's a big flaw because one of the most enjoyable things about Metroid games is the 100% collectathon you get to do at the end. It's just tedious and you don't want to do it here. You want a 100% Metroid game. You want to do it, but you don't here. And you're left with this unfinished save file for a Metroid game and that's just agony. Yo man, I'm actually having some PTSD style flashbacks to my childhood and how this game was so insanely prickly to get 100% in. Because you have to scan like every funky, stupid looking wall to complete everything and there's stuff you can miss too, rendering your save file a complete failure. It's just... <clears throat> Okay, so I've just realized that this video has just been a huge ramble about all the pent-up issues I've had with this game for like over 10 years now. So it's time to talk about some redeeming factors, because there are actually quite a few and it's not all bad. This is probably one of the spookier Metroid games, which feels weird saying it being on a handheld and all. But the creepy ambient music and blocky graphics, the eerie remains of a lost civilization, oof. You can sense the weight of these forgotten places and it feels like the right mood to go for. Since unlike the GameCube games that could indulge in some awe and beauty with their more powerful hardware and detailed visuals, the DS has more limited constraints, making it harder to pull something like that off. So the choice to go a little more gritty and moody here was the right one. And yet, it still does look visually striking at times for a DS game. Even though we still have Lava World and Ice World, there are some cool visuals hidden under the bonnet. This was also the game that introduced multiple planets and spaceships to the series, allowing Samus to fly up into space and pick from a host of destinations. This does give Hunters a new feel for the time by expanding the scope, if only really cosmetically, of the universe you're exploring. Unless you're a speedrunner that values interconnectedness, in which case you probably think they ruined the whole series by doing this. The Hunters are still a great idea, and while some of them may look a bit like discount action figures and they're overall implemented poorly, the random encounters you get with them still provide a much needed bit of unpredictability that maybe can't save the game's grind from being any less grind, but keeps things slightly fresh with an element of randomness other Metroid games are actually usually hesitant to include. It's just a shame about everything else being so formulaic. <sighs> what else did it do right? Uh, they put a Metroid Prime game on the DS and made it look like an actual Metroid game instead of changing the aesthetics dramatically and alienating the entire fanbase. It has loads of cool CGI cutscenes to show off those aesthetics too. That granted are compressed to shit, but Samus looks really cool in them. Like if anything, this game still portrays Samus as an absolute badass, which makes me even more sad that the Hunters weren't a bigger part of the story. It would have made this bit at the end where they're all getting fucked up even cooler and more meaningful. Because even in this tiny scene, it's like, yeah, those are other guys aren't on the level of this week's alien god, but me, Samus? <laughs> I'm on that level. Imagine if they had built up to this moment with, like, character interaction, other than just shooting. The company who made Hunters, NST, Nintendo Software Technologies, an American Nintendo branch, <laughs> would actually go on to get bollocked severely in later years for spending millions on such expensive cutscenes for their games. Yeah, the big boy bosses at Nintendo proper were not pleased with this liberal use of funds. And I can see why, in the case of Hunters, where it's somewhat questionable how necessary their implementation even was. Since they mainly only show up before and after the boss fights that, as you'll remember, are the same thing every time. Which must mean they ordered these after after deciding you'd fight an Orotsuka Doji demon penis four times? Wow, that must have been a sad thing to set in stone with unchangeable, expensive CGI cutscenes. Besides, what an odd task for the animators who had to figure out how to make Samus walking into the same room and fighting the same boss four times each look different on each occasion. 
I'm actually playing this on the Wii U port, which is a pretty lazy little re-release. Someone has to have the uncompressed versions of these cutscenes somewhere, so why not add them into your little new version, Nintendo? Especially after how much you spent making them. I mean, look at this, even I got my hands on some of the less compressed renders. Also, there's no online features in this port for the multiplayer they built the whole game around. And you know, maybe I should talk about that aspect of the game, because I can still get footage with bots, I guess. Multiplayer is the selling point. It's portable online Quake and it's fully featured. Well, you know, you can only play with like four hunters at once, but there's like a shitload of maps and tons of modes. Probably should have said was online a second ago though, because of course even the original DS servers are shut down now. I like the prime hunter mode where the first person to get a kill gets like super speed and power, but their health is constantly depleting. And the only way to fill it again is to kill others. Your goal being to stay as the prime hunter for as long as possible. All the different hunters are playable with their own unique HUDs and abilities, which is great. <laughs> Though some of these special abilities, man, I don't know how much scrutiny this stuff would live up to under a balance test today. Silux restores his health when he uses his electro gun, which is the only weapon that does kind of have a bit of lock on. The guy with the sniper rifle can turn invisible. It's some old fashioned chaos, man. Multiplayer was impressive though, it even had a form of voice chat back in the day thanks to the DS microphone. So to summarize, in the sense of creating a new big chunky feeling piece of Metroid content on a portable, I feel like Hunter's delivered on something? Maybe not on a great Metroid game, but a technically impressive product. I can at least say for a handheld FPS, there's a lot of juice to squeeze out of this one. You have to take into account the time frame this game came out in. Metroid was at its height in the mid 2000s, and I feel like we may never be at a point where it's as prevalent again. The franchise kind of fit that edgy Nintendo era of the GameCube and Game Boy Advance and early DS before they tried appealing to the casual market. I think it was easier to overlook the game's shortcomings in that environment when there was so much other Metroid to play as well. I mean, at the time you had great 2D Metroids, great first-person adventure Metroids. So was there really all that much harm in a Quake-style multiplayer Metroid with a below-average campaign? Yeah, probably not. Sorry for wasting your time with all of today's complaining. Yo yo, TGBS is now a Patreon supported show and a huge thanks goes out to all my Patrons and especially to the TGB legends, my top backers who you are seeing scrolling across the screen right now. If you want to help support the show, you can click on that big P in a second once the end screen stuff kicks in or you can go to patreon.com slash the gaming bread show. We've nearly reached a goal for a design series on Resident Evil, which I'm just dying to do. I also want to thank Liam Robertson who helped me with the behind the scenes info on Hunters I discussed in this video. He's got his own vids regarding behind the scenes content on both Metroid Prime Hunters and other games that were in development to NST. Links in the description, I highly recommend checking them out. Anyway gang, thanks for watching. Oh yeah, anybody else notice there's no Metroid Prime or Metroids for that matter in this game? Spooky.